Hi guys and welcome back to my channel where I talk tech and productivity and ways to make it fun in the process because no one wants to do anything boring, right? So I've been doing a series of videos to help you prepare for the AWS Cloud Practitioner examination. Today we're going to be using um, some Amazon provided questions. You can get these questions for free. I'll link them in the description below and we're just going to go through them one by one and essentially see the thought process process that I use to pass the exam. This is really, really effective in building up your knowledge and filling up gaps in your knowledge. Before we go into the questions, just a quick overview of the structure of the exam. There are 90 minutes in the exam and you have 65 questions and the questions are either multiple choice or multiple response. For the questions that Amazon provided, they're all multiple choice. However, the same principles carry over to multiple response questions. When I started doing these questions, I was really tempted to just pick the first answer that was right or the first answer that I thought was right. But after doing exam papers, I realized that they actually do give you quite a lot of time to think through all the solutions. So what I would suggest you do is actually like read through all the solutions and not only say why you think the right answer is right, but why you think the other answers are wrong. I think this also really helps fill up gaps and helps you understand concepts a little bit better. First question is, why is AWS more economical than traditional data centers for applications with varying compute workloads? Our first option is Amazon EC2 costs are built on a monthly basis. We actually know that Amazon EC2 on demand instances are not billed monthly, but by hour or second, depending on the instances you run. So from the get go, we know that that's actually just wrong. Okay. But when we look at the question, they're actually asking us why it's more economical than traditional data centers. So we're looking for something that helps us compare it to traditional data centers. Option B is that users retain full administrative access to their Amazon EC2 instances. Although this is true, this is not a benefit of AWS over traditional data centers. And option C, Amazon EC2 instances can be launched on demand when needed. Oh, exactly, because this question tells us that there is varying compute workloads. So in a traditional data center, you might have had to have compute capacity for your maximum loads but actually with AWS you can deploy virtual machines or deploy compute capacity for only what you need at that point in time and that enables you to be more efficient with your use of it. And finally, option D is that users can permanently run enough instances to handle peak workloads. Well, we don't want to permanently run enough instances only for peak workloads. The key idea here is that we only want to run what we use. So this again is not a benefit of AWS um, relative to traditional data centers. So we know for sure that C is the right answer because it tells us that instances can be run only when they are needed. Question two is, which AWS service would simplify the migration of databases to AWS? So we're essentially looking for a database migration service. So Storage Gateway is a storage solution, not a database migration service. AWS database migration service is a database migration service. So that's a pretty obvious answer. But remember, we don't stop there. We also want to eliminate the other answers. So option C says Amazon EC2. We know that Amazon EC2 is actually for compute capacity. So this is not to help simplify the migration of databases to AWS. And lastly, Amazon AppStream 2.0, which is actually not a popular service, which I see in sort of the exam questions that I've done, but it's always good to know what it is. So, you know, for sure that that's not the right answer. So if you didn't know, Amazon AppStream 2.0 is a fully managed, non-persistent desktop and application virtualization service that allows your users to securely access data applications and resources they need anywhere, anytime from any supported device. 
So again, not a database migration service. So with that, we know that the right answer is AWS database migration service. Question three, which AWS offering enables us to find, buy, and immediately start using software solutions in their AWS environment? Again, we'll go one by one. So AWS config enables you to access, audit, and evaluate the configurations of your resources. So that's not it. Um, AWS Opswork is a configuration management service that provides managed instances of Chef and Puppet, which are automation platforms, so we know that that's not it. Option C is the AWS SDK, which is short for Software Development Kits and our programming toolkits for Amazon services that simplify the use of AWS services that are unfamiliar to developers. So again, nothing to do with um, software solutions, okay? And then AWS Marketplace, hmm, hint, hint, <laughs> is a space where you can find, test, buy, and deploy software provided by trusted third parties. So again, it's very clear from this question that if you're buying and you're selling um, software solutions, that AWS Marketplace is the place to go. Let's head on to our fourth question. Which AWS networking service enables a company to create a virtual network within AWS? Again, like we've seen AWS config before, it's mostly about the configuration of AWS resources. So we know that's not in. Amazon Route 53 is a domain name service and it's designed to give developers and businesses extremely reliable and cost-effective ways to route users to the internet applications. So we know that that's not about creating a virtual network, okay? AWS Direct Next is a cloud service solution that makes it easy to establish a dedicated network connection from your premises to AWS. The last option is Amazon Virtual Private Cloud VPC, which gives you complete control over your virtual networking environment, including resource placement, connectivity, and security. So because this question is asking us what service enables a company to create a virtual network, and we know that VPCs essentially do this, we know that D is the right answer. On to our fifth question, which of the following is an AWS responsibility under the AWS shared responsibility model? Before we go into this question, I just wanted to highlight that the shared responsibility model can be summarized in one sentence. AWS is responsible for security of the cloud, so the physical hardware and things, whereas you are responsible for security in the cloud, so your EC2 instances, for example. Back to the question, option A is a configuration of third-party applications, but we know that third-party applications are the user's responsibility, so we know that that can't be right. Option B is maintaining physical hardware, um, we know that physical hardware is actually AWS's responsibility because you can't actually get access to their data centers, okay? So I think that's the right answer, but again, we must make sure that the other answers are not right as well. So option C, securing application access and data. So we know that that is security in the cloud because that's based on applications access and data and then managing guest operating systems. AWS does not manage guest operating systems. They, however, do manage host operating systems. Question six, which component of the AWS global infrastructure does Amazon CloudFront use to ensure low latency delivery? Option A is AWS regions. These are physical locations around the world with a cluster of data centers. So this has nothing to do with ensuring low latency delivery by CloudFront, okay? Option B is AWS Edge Locations. Edge Locations are AWS data centers designed to deliver services with the lowest latency possible. Amazon has dozens of data centers spread across the world, so they're closer to users than regions or availability zones, often in major cities, so that responses can be faster and snapping. So, I think that B is the right answer, edge locations, but let's look at C and D. Availability zones can't be the right answer because this is a discrete data center with redundant power networking and connectivity in an AWS region, but it's not used by CloudFront to ensure low latency delivery. And the virtual private network, as we've seen before, again, 
it has no purpose to do with ensuring low latency delivery for CloudFront. So we were right, option B is the right answer. Okay, let's move on to question seven. How would a system administrator add an additional layer of login security to a user's AWS management console? First option is Amazon Cloud Directory. So this enables you to build flexible cloud native directories for organizing hierarchies of data in multiple dimensions. So this is not an additional layer of security. Okay, option B is the audit, it's to audit AWS identity and access management roles. Although this is important, this is not an extra layer of login security. Option C is to enable multi-factor authentication also known as MFA, and it adds an extra layer of security because it requires users to provide unique authentication from an AWS supported MFA mechanism in addition to their regular signing credentials when they access AWS websites or services. So I think that's the right answer, but let's look at option D. So option D is related to CloudTrail. And as we know, CloudTrail records API calls. So this is not uh, an extra layer of security. So we were right. Option C is the right answer. Question eight, which service can identify the user that made an API call when an Amazon EC2 instance is terminated? If we see API call, I usually think CloudTrail, but again, let's go through all the options. So option A is AWS Trusted Advisor. So Trusted Advisor provides recommendations that help you follow AWS best practices. So Trusted Advisor evaluates your account by using checks. These checks identify ways to optimize your AWS infrastructure, improve security and performance, reduce costs and monitor service quotas, okay? So this has nothing to do with checking API calls that are made. However, CloudTrail is a web service that records AWS API calls for your AWS account and delivers log files to your Amazon S3 bucket. AWS CloudTrail can help the user identify API calls are made on EC2 instances. Okay, so let's look at option C and D. AWS X-Ray helps developers analyze and debug production distributed applications. Option D is AWS Identity Access Management, which enables you to manage access to AWS services and resources securely. So this again doesn't have anything to do with users um, finding out API calls are made to an EC2 instance. So we know that AWS CloudTrail is the right answer. Well, let's move on to question nine. So which service would be used to send alerts based on Amazon CloudWatch alarms? Option A is this Amazon Simple Notification Service. This is actually a fully managed messaging service for both application to application and application to person communication. So this looks like a good choice, but let's look at B, C, and D. CloudTrail records API calls, so this is not it. And Trusted Advisor provides recommendations that help follow AWS best practices, so this is not it as well. And option D is Route 53. And again, we've seen that earlier, Route 53 is a domain name system. So this has nothing to do with sending alerts to Amazon CloudWatch alarm. So the right answer here is Amazon Simple Notification Service. And the moment you've all been waiting for, the last question on our list is question 10. And it is, where can a user find information about prohibited actions on the AWS infrastructure? Again, AWS Trusted Advisor is best practice, but it doesn't actually have anything to do with prohibited behavior. I don't even know whether I'm saying that right. Prohibited? Prohibited behavior, okay? Um, option B is AWS Identity Access Management. Um, and that enables users to manage access to AWS services securely so it's not it doesn't really tell us about prohibited actions and option c is the aws billing console so this is essentially just helps you pay your aws bill and shows you how to essentially engage with billing on your aws account so that really doesn't have anything to do with prohibited actions however the aws acceptable use policy governs the use of aws services 
and its affiliate services and website. So that is the right answer. This wraps up our sort of question and answer session. Um, I hope that was helpful. I know some of these questions were, um, were, were, were more basic and simple, but I hope that the concept of going through each of the services and taking a second to recognize what each of those services do can actually help you get into a process of elimination rather than just picking the right answer and that would really really help prepare for the exam and also ensure that you're really thorough when answering questions i hope this video has been helpful if it has please give it a thumbs up and if you like this content just subscribe to the channel and join the family see you all um, later and good luck with your AWS exam. See you on the other side of being certified. Bye.